Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, just been catching up with a few folks. I mean, I know pretty much everybody. I guess I haven't met really Jackie before, but uh, nice to meet you. You too, Jackie. And, and Mark. Um, anyway, so the purpose of my connection with Lauren, of course, played the crucial role in our development of Where the Rivers Flow North and Disappearances and also Windy Acres. Anybody remember Windy Acres? <laughs> the crazy little yeah. uh, comedy series we did back in 2001 or so. We were seeing the actors. From Sarah Burns, we saw her last night on uh, Enlightenment. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Major role with uh, Nic um, Laura Dern. Uh huh. I want to watch that series. Yeah. Because uh, we just watched. Uh, White Lotus. Lotus. White Lotus. Yes. Oh, my oh, God. God. Yeah. Tell me. You have to see it. Have you seen White Lotus? Oh, my God. <laughs> you got to watch yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Um, so anyway, you know, I started making narrative films in 1988, so it's been a while. And I'm approaching a project right now that, strangely, I first decided I wanted to do in 1974 uh, when I was... When I moved to Vermont on May 1st and on May and walked into the house and said, how do you heat this place? <laughs> <laughs> Literally moved here on May 1st. Where, how, how do you heat it? Because it was still cold. May 1st. And uh, looked all around the house and saw in this basement this huge furnace. But what's... And so I walk up to the guy that sold us the place. He said, you put wood in it. <laughs> I said, what? There's no, like, thermostat? So I went out and bought a chainsaw. There was this guy in St. Johnsbury, Ziggy was his name, and for some reason he took a liking to me at Peck Hardware, which was the, the hardware of all hardware stores, really, fabulous. And I would go in there and I would buy, I would, I'd put everything, you know, chainsaw, you know, seven gallons of paint, and he'd say, how about $12.50? <laughs> I'd say Ziggy. <laughs> anyway, um, he had a long career at that uh, Pack Hardware. They went on to St. J Hardware, where I noticed they didn't lounge near the cash register. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he was a St. Johnsbury original, had a toupee, drove a big Buick. Um, anyway, so I got a chainsaw, went out and started cutting trees. And I had to borrow a farm truck uh, from the guy next down the hill from us in Pasumsek. And I, I filled up the back of the farm truck with, with wood for this furnace um, and was, was hauling the wood down a hill to, to where we were and the brakes went out on it. Mm. And the hill is like two miles long, right? And so about a quarter of a mile into the descent without brakes in this huge farm truck loaded with wood, I said, I think I should bail out. You know, I just, there's no other choice here. And, I, you know, I mean, and so I did and broke my uh, right arm. Oh my God. And so spent my first winter in Vermont at the Vermont Historical Society, like four days a week, writing with my left hand notes on Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys and, and wrote about 200 pages of stuff, you know, and said, this will make a great movie. But um, the truth is, I didn't really know anything at that point about making it a narrative film and so I've sort of circled back and and I'm what I I expect this next project to be my last movie and is taking on the subject of Revolutionary War era Vermont through the Ethan Allen story and a parallel story focused on Lucy Terry Prince whose poem Bars Fight uh, is the first known piece of African American literature uh, and who was enslaved at the age of three uh, without parents uh, and uh, in western Massachusetts and for 30 years served the family, uh, the Wells family in like Northampton and was then bought out of slavery by her husband, Abijah Prince. Her, she was Lucy Terry, he was Abijah Prince who had also been enslaved and uh, on the occasion of his master's death was freed. And strangely, you know, they married while she was still enslaved, and they had three kids while she was still enslaved, four kids while she was still enslaved. 
And he then went off and fought in the French and Indian War to earn the money he needed to buy her out of slavery. Um, and so they did, and, and one, of, one of the families in Northampton gave him a 50-acre deed to a New Hampshire grant in Guilford, Vermont. Why was it called New Hampshire Grant if it was in Guilford, Vermont? Well, because it wasn't called Vermont then. Oh. Uh, as people who spent any time <laughs> think, knowing, I mean, Vermont was disputed territory. Right. And, and a corrupt governor in New Hampshire, fortunately, <laughs> gave cheap land grants to poor settlers, mostly from Connecticut, who wouldn't have really had this opportunity any other way because they came back from the French and Indian War and found that all the big land and good land had been bought up. And so, but here's this thing in Vermont, up, up, in, up north, in New Hampshire, grants. But the problem is that uh, the royal government uh, favored huge New York land owners and their possession of this territory. So you had families with three and 400,000 acre tracts of land who claimed, this, no, this is our land. And they started settling it for New York while the New Hampshire grantees were settling it under New Hampshire grants. And the New Hampshire grantees fought off the New York encroachments and land settlers successfully, ultimately, partly because the American Revolution intervened and changed the dynamics sufficiently so that New York enforcement was disrupted for a period of time and then anyway it continued and as people probably know Vermont was an independent republic for 13 years and it was finally at the behest of Alexander Hamilton who had opposed the, the, Vermont, the New Hampshire grantees for a long time and he was, of course was George Washington's number one aide. Um, 1791 is when Vermont became a state the 14th state. But for 13 years it was an independent republic and before that there was this struggle going back and forth. So anyway, it's a fascinating story. But it's also, tr and, it's, it, it's, uh, and, and it also has larger implications. You know, Vermont, the, the Green Mountain Boys were really the third big land struggle of poor settlers against sort of feudal land barons. The first being in, New, in New North Carolina, the regulators movement where poor settlers were moved off their land by lawyers and, and big land owners um, and fought back. And a brutal governor, Governor Tryon, crushed them brutally. Then a movement grew up in the Hudson Valley, the Hudson River Valley, same thing. Poor settlers fighting against, you know, the Rensselaers and the, the huge land-owning families. And Tryon was sent by the king to become the governor of New York and he crushed them. The king of? England. Uh, and so a number of the, of the Hudson Valley guys came over to Vermont. And so a number of the lieutenants of the Green Mountain Boys were actually veterans of the, New ha of the Hudson Valley struggle. And the Green Mountain Boys won. Uh, so that's sort of interesting. But um, Ethan Allen himself, of course, also had an interest in land speculation and, and at his peak, driven partly by his brother Ira, laid claim to 200,000 acres of land, mostly in the Champlain Valley. And they, they, they were around Bennington, all that was fine, and they wanted land, but then they took a trip, remember Baker and Ira, up to the Champlain Valley and said, whoa, whoa. Flat land. We want this land. <laughs> this is the land we want. One of the problems is that Abenakis and Mohawks were already there. And so there was, you know, there was there was dealing, wheeling. Remember Baker, who was Ethan Allen's cousin and, and the third member of their triumvirate for the Onion River Land Company, went up to to survey land and carry a proposal from Ethan Allen to the Mohawks and was killed by the Mohawks. Uh, so they weren't particularly on board with Ethan's uh, aspirations at that point. So anyway, one of the things that's always struck me about Vermont, I mean, at least in the circles I have, have been in, that, and early on especially, the idea was that Vermont was never really settled 
before the white settlers came here. But there really was not a significant indigenous presence. And there certainly, I didn't hear anything about an African American presence at all. And so partly the goal of this telling the story is to try to create a multiracial perspective on what was happening then. So there are scenes involving indigenous people. Uh, there are scenes involving not just the princes, uh, but it was just confirmed within the last year that one of the ca one of the deaths, uh, one of the Green Mountain Boys who died at the Battle of Bennington was black. Mm. Yeah, uh, Sit Ives is his name. Uh, but that's not really generally known. And, and uh, Lemuel Haynes, you know, who was an abolitionist pastor in Rutland, fought also with the Green Mountain Boys. Black um, became a, a preacher who was the first recipient of an honorary degree, the first African-American recipient of an honorary degree from Middlebury College. So it's a fascinating history, and it's, and it's very dramatic. And one of the things that makes it dramatic is, you know, the, the princes settled in Guilford. And Abijah was an extremely entrepreneurial guy. He had run a ferry in, in Western Massachusetts, uh, you know, on his hand, you know, pole in a, in a raft getting people across the Connecticut River. And here he built a wooden wagon and would go back and forth to Northampton. And we have him also going to Bennington on occasion, taking stuff for uh, you know, the local shop owner who needed thread and silk and coffee from Northampton. And he would run, uh, he would run a courier service back and forth. So these, the, the princes were highly aspirational and started a, f a homestead farm uh, and made friends. And, but they had a neighbor, John Noyes, who made their life as difficult as he possibly could. And had a bit of a mob that he was associated with, and so there was provocation. But the interesting thing also is that in this development for them to try to take, really take root in, in Guilford, was the fact that southeastern Vermont was fiercely pro-New York and anti-Green Mountain Boy. So that Guilford, and Guilford was the largest town in Vermont at that point, strangely, wow. strangely. But anyway, so 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 Guilford, it's 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 right along the Mass Border by it's right by the Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. South the Brattleboro. Yeah. 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 yeah, I live in Green River. That's a college town. Yeah. It's no, no, no. 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 that's one. We shot a lot of northern borders in Guilford. Oh yeah, I love Guilford. Um, anyway, so Guilford, Brattleboro, Marlboro, Putney, Newfane were all pro New York like 70%, but 30% were pro-Green Mountain Boys. And so the princes sort of fell in with the pro-Green Mountain Boys group, and their antagonist was associated with the Yorker group. So the politics of the moment transcend just the racial stuff that was happening with them. It's caught up in the larger issue. And, and partly what I'm discovering working on the script now is that the deep division that existed in that town essentially parallels what's going on in the United States right now. And, and because people were really rough with each other. They were kidnapping each other. They were burning each other's places down. I mean, you know, it was intense. And so it's a very dramatic story. And it's sort of, you know, the parallel, and there is some overlap. You know, the, the idea of this Vermont place, liberty, freedom, land, and, um, you know, the American dream before there was such a term or concept. But Ethan Allen and the princes had two different notions of what this means. The princes are just trying to get their 50 acre plot together. <laughs> and Ethan Allen is sort of trying to, well, he actually at one point said, I should rule the world. <laughs> I mean, Ethan Allen was a little, I, I met with this historian, Nat Philbrick, last week for lunch. He was a pretty well respected historian. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm doing this picture on Ethan. He said, Ethan Allen's a psychopath. So. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing he said to us, Ethan Allen. The first, the first thing he said. So I refer to him as, you know, fa Vermont founding father, political instigator, land speculator, and runaway truck of a man. <laughs> it's sort of how I see him, you know. And there's so some humor in it. Huh? That's so disappointing. Yeah, right. I know, everybody, yeah, like, different everything. idea of Ethan Allen. How did Jim Hogue get so into him? And Who? Jim, Jim Hogue. Hogue. Uh-huh. 
who dedicated his guy life to like the, honoring yeah. me, uh-huh. you know, and he's yeah. such a smart guy. How did he miss the fact that he was a narcissist? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, there's John Duffy and Nick Muller, who, who John Duffy was the keeper of the Ethan Allen papers for most for mm-hmm. like the last forty years, and he has he has, they they produced some very interesting new research on Ethan Allen, which are kept where here, here uh, in Vermont. Or? They were in Vermont. John Duffy died a year ago. Uh, but they did a book called Inventing Ethan Allen, and they just did, they did a final book that was published just after he died uh, about Ethan Allen's friendship with uh, Philip Skeen, Skeensboro. Uh, anyway, which a is Yorker? Not really part of our story. Huh? That sounds like a Yorker. Who was a Yorker? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Right. Well, that's the whole thing. Ethan Allen played both sides of the aisle yeah. whenever he needed to and whenever he wanted to, including negotiating with the British. Lying, right? Saying a false threat. Yeah, I mean, he was ready to make a deal with the, to return Vermont to the British. Or he said yeah. he would. While he had also met with George Washington, and, and you know, this was, and was, you know, and, and, and so it's our job to understand why he did that, and, to, and because you want, in a movie, you want everybody to be right from their point of view. Yeah. You know, you don't want to say, oh, this no guy's wrong. Papers. That no story about how he threatened yeah. to, to collaborate with the British, that'll be in the movie? That'll definitely be that in the movie. That's a great story. That'll so be definitely be in the movie. real tribal people for the And we world? will deal with, we will have real tribal people. I mean, you know, we ha- I've made, two, you know, two or three movies before with indigenous actors, but we're going to need, frankly, more than we've ever had before. So, um, but yes. Um, You're going to get Gary Farmer again? Gary will be here. Tantu will be here. Oh, you know, oh my um, God! And so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll bring them in. Is that a value you hold, like in general? That how strongly you hold that value? I understand it might be hard. Well, but we want to. Nobody should be represented by. No, no, no. I mean, I, I produced a festival for the Champlain Quadricentennial, mm-hmm. and we got like 20 indigenous dancers here, some of whom are also actors. So there's a there's an indigenous community of dancers and actors in Montreal. Although it's hard to get them across the border, we will. This is one of the challenges that we'll face. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary Farmer is Mohawk, you know, and that's the group that um, we're dealing with principally. We we have also an Abenaki presence, but we we distinguish. I thought between he's the Huron. No. Huh? I thought he's Huron. No. Gary, no, he's he's uh, he's he's Mohawk. Mohawk. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, so exploring this story is fascinating. It's multi-layered all the time. And it is huge, actually. But, you know, we are within, I think, two or three weeks from producing a 140-page script. All of my scripts have been 120 pages. This has to go 140 pages. Um, Which makes a film of approximately what length? An hour and uh, two hours and 20 minutes. Oh, or it could, minute it, it could become three 45-minute uh, three part 45 minutes each series uh, and maybe will be edited as both modern Americans love a series modern Americans love a series and so and given the nature of distribution which we could talk about for a long time uh, to be flexible on uh, is, is what makes sense you know because in fact the feature film is probably uh, you know going to become extinct or become a very rare item. I mean, the, the series is really becoming the same. Thing, but, um, so anyway, so it's a lot, if it's a lot of material, but I think it's shaping up really well. Uh, I have a co-director. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at bringing a co-director onto the project who would be an African-American woman uh, to be directing with me. So be at a collaborative uh, artistic leadership for the project. We've made an offer to uh, Natasha Engeza, who is a uh, film professor at Middlebury College, has made four short narrative films. Uh, her husband, actually, is, is Chilean and uh, is, an, um, was the, is a sound designer and sound recordist who did the uh, Natalie Portman, Jackie Kennedy movie and some other films like that. So anyway, We'll see whether she goes for it. It's a little complicated for her, but I think she wants to do it. But she has to get release time from Middlebury and stuff like that. Um, but there are other people on, you know, that we have as prospects. But I, it seems to be the right thing to do, given the mo- given the moment, given the story, given uh, Lucy Terry Prince's, uh, you know, extraordinary sort of journey here. 
one of the things that Lucy managed to do, she, she, she sort of instinctive, she was very much, you know, a, a follower of Jesus and God and, you know, a religious person and a church person, but she also was extraordinary with words and, and uh, basically set up like a, 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 a talking post outside her house where people would come and talk and where she would tell stories and where there would be some music and, and stuff like that. So she was very much into sort of oral, uh, you know, narrative. Um, but she also learned to use the courts to, d to advance their civil rights and did so successfully, even to the Supreme Council of the state of Vermont, still a fledgling republic, uh, traveling, you know, 60 miles to Norwich being kept waiting for three days and finally being admitted to the chamber with Thomas Chittenden and Ira Allen and company to make her case about what they were experiencing in Guilford and was given a unanimous act of protection by the Supreme Council, which was taken back to Guilford and became the subject of the town meeting that we must protect the Prince family. Shortly afterwards, their barn was burned down by uh, John Noyes and company, but for the first time, the charges resulted in jail time for the people that did the uh, action. And that's part of your narrative? That's part of the narrative, also. Sort of the end of their story. Um, but they were, they were battered badly enough that they had to sell their property. But they were given a guarantee that, that for as long as Abijah lived, they could stay there. He lived for only a few more years. He was older than Lucy, and he died. And then Lucy and the family moved to a land claim that Abijah had in Sunderland, which is near Arlington, Vermont. And their land claim had been poached by Ethan Allen's cousin. No, his, his cousin-in-law, his wife Mary's uh, is it her brother or her cousin, I can't remember, uh, Brownson. And, but they managed to get an accommodation and some land, and Lucy lived there until the age of 93, I believe, and made a pilgrimage back to Abijah's grave in Guilford every year uh, by horseback. Do you have a title? The title is Lost Nation. That's the title we're using. Did right she now. live to the mid-19th century? Uh, she, she lived till about uh, 1820 or 21 or 22, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, extraordinary. Abijah, I believe, died in, in 1793, maybe. Um, so anyway, you know, part of the idea here is to make a strong position that Vermont was racially diverse from day one. And not only that, interesting, dynamic, mm -hmm. in some ways exemplary people. Uh, John Noyes went on to become a politician, a successful politician in early Vermont. Um, I think he may have even run for lieutenant governor. These are things I need to figure out. I mean, it's, to me, it's not that important right now, but it, it, we'll have postscripts that make some of this clear. And also to find in John Noyes, why was he the way he was, and to, to, to take it beyond the question of redneck and to try to look deeper into, uh, you know, racial animus and its roots, which I felt that we did somewhat in, in uh, Stranger in the Kingdom. It's one of the things that interested me, that you had, you had the redneck, you had the xenophobe, you know, I mean, you know, Rusty's character, Harlan Kittredge was the redneck, you know, the, 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 the sheriff was the xenophobe, uh, Elijah was the fundamentalist, you know, Char